when we talked about the the in between on the in between assignment 1A, the line squiggling down there, the effect that's being created there is it's not overlapping action necessarily. It is sort of overlapping action, but it, it follows a path of action that is absolute. And whenever you put something in motion, it's got to follow that path of action unless there's something that's going to cause that object to change direction suddenly and whatever is following behind it will simply follow through with whatever that main object does. So what we're going to do here in this assignment is basically similar to what we did on the last assignment when we added the second ball. We're going to add a tail onto the back end of this character. And you can put it on either side. It doesn't matter which side you put it on. But just the same as when we did the double ball, remember we asked the question, what shape is this ball going to be? We don't know on drawing number one. Right? So with overlapping action, we always usually delay by one or two drawings from the key position. So in this instance here, we'll fall back to what we did before, where we had the action coming down, and it was on drawing number five that we knew absolutely for sure what was going to be happening with this top ball, because it was going its maximum speed that it could go, therefore it was going to stretch this ball out. How much you stretch it determine, is determined by your desire to make it more stretchy. So if you looked online at the examples that I did um, for that lecture, I don't know if you saw how I delayed it even more, and I put it out in front and off to the side, and et cetera, et cetera, and played around with the timing on it to create a different type of an effect. So in this instance here, we know for sure that this tail is going to be trailing out on the side like this. So we're going to put it at roughly about the 2 o'clock position on your ball. So if you look at the center line going through here, that's 3 o'clock, there's 2 o'clock, there's 1 o'clock, and there's 12 o'clock straight up. We're going to put the tail at about the 2 o'clock position here, and we're just going to drift it off like this, and make it roughly about the same height as your second ball there. Now later on, if you want to choose to change this line from just a simple line into an actual tail, you can modify it and turn it into an actual tail if you want to. I'll leave that up to you. Alright, so I'm just going to take all my drawings off except for number five. I'll just leave that down first. And now again, as we did with the double ball bounce, straight ahead animation implies that we are straight aheading, or overlapping action requires that we do straight ahead in between your drawing. So therefore, we're just going to proceed on to drawing number six, which again, as the ball drops here, it's continuing to drop. We could modify this slightly, or we can keep it at the two o'clock position and simply have it continue to trail at the exact same position as the previous one but maybe pull it in just slightly. So you can see if I overlap the two drawings here, I pulled the line in ever so slightly there. I really should have it up a little bit higher here. But if I get that to drag just a little bit more, it's just going to pull on the line a little bit further like that. So the effect will be this. See how the line pulls in in this direction here? We're just getting a little bit more of a pull on it as it drops down. next drawing, number seven, is the impact point where the bottom ball has now contacted the ground. It contacted the ground in this one, but it wasn't affected by the ground. Now it's contacted the ground and it's been affected by the fact that it's squishing. So therefore, the tail now is going to move from the two o'clock position probably over to about the three o'clock position here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pull it out here to the side, open up the loop a little bit, and then we're going to curl it back into where the previous line was on this drawing here. So the path of action that we're creating for this tail is coming down in this direction here. From that point through that point. And so we want to match that up by getting the tail to loop back into that connection point right about there. Now the effect that we're creating here is very similar to if you've ever watched like the Olympics or some major gymnastics type thing they usually have a, a floor routine where the gymnasts will go out and they'll do their tumbling and flipping and rolling and whatnot. And sometimes they'll have like the ball that they're also doing their tumbling and trying to balance it and stuff. And then there's also that other goofy sport where they have a stick with a streamer on the end of it. And they go out and they go prancing around on the, on the floor and they start swirling their baton around. And the streamer goes in behind. Well, the streamer is basically the same thing as this tail. Wherever the, the stick goes as it moves across, the streamer will follow 
that endpoint. So no matter what happens with this stick, if I make a figure eight like this, the streamer will follow in a figure eight pattern. If I do this, the streamer will follow in a circular pattern. Right? If I go back and forth like this, it'll just flip back and forth in a straight line. Correct? Okay, if I went like this, you know, let's say I was prancing across the floor and I was jumping up and down like that, it would create a waving action. Right? So that's the idea behind this instance here where we've got the tail simply following behind what the primary motivator, which is the bottom part of the character here, the bottom ball, whatever it does, this simply follows along. So the ball is bouncing straight up and down, but there's a cause and effect that when it hits the ground, you can see this part here is descending down, but this part here is still trailing behind. So the effect here is that it looks like it's impacting at that point, but this part here at the tip has not been affected by the impact yet. So now when we move to number eight, or 7A, sorry. Here's where our ball is moving back up again. So we're going to rotate the tail from the 3 o'clock position down to the 4 o'clock position on the body. There's 3 o'clock, there's 6 o'clock, 5, 4. So we're going to rotate it down to the 4 o'clock position here and have it droop down and we're going to have it touching the ground. Right there. So it's impacted on the ground here and then we're going to loop it back up into the previous path of action that we had right here. Okay, so it's just following where it was originally going. Now you could, if you wanted to, you could pull it out a little bit further here just to get a little bit more of a flopping type of an action. So if you pull it out to the side there, like that, that would probably be okay as well. Okay, so it starts to pull away. Now I've made it a little bit too long there, I'd have to shorten it up just a bit by erasing it off, but I'll deal with that later on. Now going up into number eight, this is where we've got the full stretch position on its way up. We're going to pull the tail now down a little bit further here and get it to pull right through that path of action that we had on the previous drawing with just a little bit of a curl right there because it's following the loop of where it touched the ground. Then on number nine, we're going up. We'll keep the tail trailing down in this direction here. And in this one, it's going to be going straight down. It's basically the opposite of number five. It's being pulled very hard straight up. And now this is the point at which the ball begins to lose its energy. Gravity starts to take over and it begins to slow as it moves up to its high point. So as that energy is being dissipated in the upward movement, we're also going to lose energy in the pull on the side over here. So the tail is now going to begin to rotate on the body and pull out and away, but still pointing the, the tip down towards that path of action that we had. So it's going to pull out in this direction here that. And as it moves up, it's basically just going to unfold so that when it reaches its high point, it's going to then going to reverse direction as the ball comes down. It'll then get pulled on the bottom. The tip part here will roll over, similar to what it did on the bottom. It's going to roll over and then snap out into its straight position on the way down. So on number 11, which is the drawing just before the high point, this is where we begin to pull the tail out to the 3 o'clock position here. Then we go to number one, which is our high point. So here we can tick the tail maybe to about the 2.30 point. So let's just take a look at the action that we've got so far. Going from our number five drawing. Here it is dropping down. It's the ground flips and reverses and then begins to release. So it's losing its energy both in the bottom ball and in this part of the tail. So now here's the tricky part and we'll be repeating this same type of action later on 
when we go to the double ball bounce or the double descending energy ball bounce and then into the uh, overlapping pendulum. As the ball now begins to drop from the high point on number two, we're going to pull the tail. We're going to reverse the direction on this part here because it's now being pulled down. So instead of curving it this way, we're now curving it the opposite way. But we're then going to loop this part across here because this part of the tail is still going up while this part here is going down and this part here is trailing around. So we've got to get this to follow through like this. So we want to make sure that that tip is progressing on a path of action that makes sense. So if we were to go back, let me just show you how the path of action works. I'll just put this on. So we'll go from drawing number five. There's the tip of my tail right there. Then we go to drawing number six. Here's the tip of the tail down here. So let's move down to this position. Then on number seven, the tip of the tail is moved down here. Number seven A, the tip is moved out here. Eight, it's down here. Nine, it's coming back up into this position. So if I trace this off just to make it clear, here's the path of action. So nine there. 10 moves up to here. There's 10 there, just to make it clearer. 11 is moving out to this position. 1 is up here. 2 is over here. And so to get it to loop back in there, I would have to follow this type of a path of action here to get it to loop back in. So, if this is my number two drawing here, and this is my number five drawing here, we've got two in betweens, four and or uh, three and four that we have to put in here. We could put three here and four right there. Those are the two positions. As it reaches its high point and slows down and then curls over, I could even pull that over to here a little bit more to slow in and then speed up and. So you can see your spacing as it speeds up down here, slows down, slows down, comes down. Right. So now we go to drawing number three. Eight, Sorry? Eight. Number eight. eight. Six, seven, eight. Seven, eight. Sorry. Eight is being pulled. So we just have a little bit of a pull here. Now the main thing to to since we're at this point here, is we have to put a little bit of a loop there to follow the path of action from the previous drawing. But then once the ball moves up and it's going in a straight line here, we have to maintain this straightness here all the way through. Okay? So at no point should the tip of the tail ever curl out like this. Right? The tip of the tail will never curl to lead the action. It's just following along. Okay, this is the connection point that's pulling. Everything else just follows. So this is one of the major mistakes that people will often make on this assignment, is either on the up action or on the down action. For some reason, they'll put this little curl in here. Don't do it, all right? Because then what happens is, as the tail comes up, it does this little flipping action, and you don't want that, all right? Sometimes you might see it on the sail of a ship if there's a really strong wind and there's a pull on it. You might see the flapping action. But in this case here, it's just a simple follow through type of an action where you would never flip the tail on a downward action to make that part lead. It's just following through with it. Right? So don't put any flips or curls on the tail at all. So now going to number three. Oops. We're continuing to pull the ball down, but we have to follow this path of action up and around here. We're going to keep our curve in this direction here going here, and the pull up and over here, like that. And then on number four, again, we can just do straight ahead, but we have to match it into number five, so we've got to pull that drawing off and get it back over here. So we have to do a natural in-between, between three and five to make it 
move smoothly so that we know where we're going from and to. So here's the tip of the tail there, and we've got to come down to this position here, so it's got to curl over like this. So that will dictate our automatic path of action. So we simply find the halfway point there. So now you can make that curl tighter if you want to. I've made it fairly wide open, which tends to make the tail a little bit stiffer. Oops, let me put this in order. By doing what I've done, it makes the tail feel fairly stiff. I mean, it still has some bend to it, but it is fairly stiff on the way back up. Right in that section there, and then it's got the curl on it. And once we shoot it at a proper time, it'll look it'll look right. It's got a nice little snap at the bottom there. And it comes up in reverse this direction and comes back down. So it's just a simple matter of following through and thinking about what is that part of the body or that element of the character going to be doing. So we can apply this simple principle to a lot of our animation as we make it move. Things like uh, uh, the edge flap of a coat, an arm, as a character moves from one position to another, you'll get a bit of a drag on the arm. Hair, long hair, a ponytail or something like that. As a character's running, it'll do this type of a flipping action. So there are lots of implications that we can, or instances where we can put this principle into play in our animation. We'll keep applying it over and over and over again as we move through the, the various assignments. All right? Okay.